months ago, we ran out of dishwashing detergent for our automatic dishwasher. I picked up a box of dishwashing powder because it was the lowest waste option in the store. And I saw this on the back of the package. And I wondered, do I need four times the dishwashing power? Ultimately, I stuck with my box of powder. It was cheap and it was small. And today I'm going to talk to you about what happened. Hello, I'm Angel, and welcome to my channel. Now I've been wondering about dishwashing powder and it's led me to wonder a lot about dishwashers. Why don't things seem to work as long as they used to or at least as long as customers expect them to? I'm not the only one who's noticed this. People have been looking for an answer for a while now. Some people will point to federal water efficiency standards as a reason why dishwashers don't work as well as they used to. Remember the dishwasher, you'd press it, boom, there'd be like an explosion. Five minutes later, you open it up, the steam pours out, the dishes. Now you press it 12 times. Women tell me, again, you know, they give you four drops of water. And they're in places where there's so much water, they don't know what to do with it. Or phosphates being banned from dishwashing powder in some states. Bans started in 2010 in 16 states. And people in states without the phosphate ban are also having trouble with their dishwashers. And the water argument? No. I don't buy it. If the first time a person ran their dishwasher and it wasn't working the way they wanted it to, they would call Lowell's or whoever they bought it from and have them pick it up and bring them a new one. In the good old days, our grandparents would have considered a dishwasher an expensive luxury item. Dish soap was more often advertised and people just did dishes by hand. Still, dishwashers and other appliances were considered durable goods and our grandparents may have even used a form of store credit to purchase their first appliances. The interest would have been low and the products would have lasted more than a decade. My grandmother's washing machine lasted more than 30 years. We live in a consumer-driven economy. People need to buy stuff in order for it to function. Entered planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence can come in many forms. Obsolescence of quality, where products are made with less durable goods, such as plastic instead of metal, and stop making the parts in order to repair older models. Obsolescence of function, where the new model is able to do more and better things. And obsolescence of desirability, rolling out a new model every so often that looks different. This last one can also be referred to as perceived obsolescence. The term planned obsolescence can be traced back to Bernard London's 1932 pamphlet, Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence. The term creative waste was used that same year by two authors in the book Consumer Engineering, A New Technique for Prosperity. All argued for the limited lifespan of goods. London wanted the government to set those standards. All agreed that consumers replacing goods on a regular basis was good for profit margins. But the idea of planned obsolescence existed long before it had a name. In the 1920s, the light bulb manufacturers got together in what would become known as the Phoebus Cartel and decided to limit the durability of light bulbs to a maximum of 1,000 operational hours. Although, from a purely technical perspective, light bulbs exceed this lifetime by far. There's even a light bulb in my hometown that is still operating 100 years after it was installed. But companies liked the idea. Post-war consumers had money to burn and those durable goods were still a pretty good deal. Just a search of the term on Google Books and newspapers.com shows that the use of the phrase became more popular in the late 1950s and remained popular through the 70s. The argument was relatively consistent. It's terrible for consumers and it's awful for the environment. If you've seen my Earth Day video, you know that at this time, people were pretty outspoken about their environmental concerns. Sheldon and Ahrens wrote, we still have tree covered slopes to deforest and subterranean lakes of oil to tap with our gushers. 
Vance Packard wrote three very influential books about how marketers psychologically manipulated customers into buying inferior, unnecessary products. Companies ran ads distancing themselves from the practice. Therefore, an argument about consumers not necessarily wanting to buy a more durable product because of the increased expense doesn't hold up. Sometimes when I'm thinking about things like this, I get a little distracted. And some of the other things that I thought sort of overlapped with this were that wages in the United States have remained relatively stagnant since the 1970s, meaning that people no longer had the same buying power as the post-war generation did. In the 1980s, banks began extending credit to just about everyone at a price instead of just to their wealthiest customers. That meant that at least in theory, dishwashers would be accessible to a lot more families and people would buy them, except they didn't. If we use 50% as a benchmark to determine between early adopters and the wealthy and something that's made for the everyday average American consumer, the dishwasher was out of reach for most Americans for a long time. In 1958, roughly 4% of American households had a dishwasher. By 1971, that number had only climbed to 18%. It wasn't until 1997 that 50% of American households had a dishwasher. That's extremely slow when compared to the refrigerator, which took just over a decade. And that was with an active icebox industry trying to push the refrigerator back into the <laughs> refrigerator box. <laughs> Today, about 75% of American homes have dishwashers. Free market enthusiasts will say, that's right, let the consumer decide. Their demand will drive price and quality. And that's an excellent argument for people who live in a free market economy, but we don't, not entirely. We live in a country that has a long history of anti-competitive behavior. Monopolies and the more difficult to spot as a consumer, oligopolies. We have antitrust laws covering collusion that historically seem to have done little for customers. There are three types of corporate collusion, fixing prices, rivals, and rules. My research suggests that rules, also known as type three, has historically been used to argue against planned obsolescence. Type three talks about the cushion from competition customer isolation, and the pricing freedom that that brings. Companies don't have to get together to agree not to compete. Customer isolation is where information for making an informed decision, like comparison shopping, is difficult or time consuming to come by. Environmental laws have also been used to challenge the practice, as well as other narrow areas of law, such as unfair commercial practices or consumer protection laws, according to some legal experts. None of these tools, however, is likely to address the specific issue of planned obsolescence fully. They believe the existing law that seems best suited for the task is warranty law. I don't know anything about the law because I'm not a lawyer, but I do know that things don't seem to be getting any better for the consumer. Now, dishwashers move towards a slow and gradual death at about five years, and many will not last past 10. As the dishwasher passes into its golden years, we take something out and we're like, hey, this isn't quite as clean as it should be. Then we're at the grocery store and, oh look, here's a more powerful dishwashing powder and something for streaks and it's more expensive than the regular stuff. It comes in challenging to recycle packaging, all to try to kick the can of replacing a dishwasher down the road a little ways. I've been talking about my dishwasher, but I'm sure you've noticed a bit of overlap between durable goods and tech. You might remember hearing about the tech world's right to repair movement that has led to 20 states introducing right to repair bills in recent years. The right to repair concept began with the automobile industry. Massachusetts passed the United States first. Motor Vehicle Owners Right to Repair Act in 2012, which required automobile manufacturers to provide the necessary documents and information to allow anyone to repair their own vehicle. While not passed at the federal level, 
The major automobile trade organizations signed a memorandum to agree to abide by Massachusetts law in all 50 states starting in the 2018 automotive year. We could pass a similar law for durable goods, but that wouldn't protect customers because isolate and exploit could still be used against consumers to get the parts. In 2018, the European Parliament passed legislation severely limiting planned obsolescence. We could have a national law here doing the same thing. Consider it, let me know what you think in the comments section below. We finished our box of dishwashing powder. It's been beautifully recycled and I'm happy to report that it worked just fine. Please give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.